hypertension, anaerobic metabolism, and uh, evidence of hemodynamic criteria which are consistent with having a low cardiac output state. And the mortality for patients with cardiogenic shock is remarkably high. All patients going into cardiogenic shock have at best a 40 to 50 percent survival. This is a very severe problem when it happens. What sort of patients will we, will we be looking at for post-cardiac surgery um, problems? Well, we, first of all, we have those who are completely reversible, potentially, who just have a stunned myocardium, potentially from inadequate protection or maybe a little bit of air down the coronaries. To those who are potentially reversible with myocardial infarctions or acute pulmonary hypertension from whatever cause. And then there are those who have an irreversible problem, um, either due to this being an insult which is on top of severe existing ventricular dysfunction, myocardial infarctions, etc. What do we need to look at? Sorry, the projection of this isn't great, but we're looking at patients fundamentally who are hypotensive following CPB, and that can be due to a low cardiac output state or low peripheral vascular resistance. If peripheral vascular resistance is very low, then it's a combination of fluids and vasopressors. And low cardiac output state, clearly heart rate needs to be addressed, contractility needs to be addressed, preload needs to be addressed, um, basic inotropy needs to be commenced, all before you need to start thinking about VA ECMO. So let's look at the alternative therapies that are available. First of all, inotropic therapy. Inotropes are difficult. They're all we have in terms of the chemical uh, makeup. We have a range of drugs available. None of them have been shown to be beneficial to patients. And many of them have been shown to actively increase mortality, particularly adrenaline, particularly vasopressin, particularly dibutamine. So they've, they've been clearly demonstrated recurrently, but they are all that we have, and we are effectively flogging the heart in order to maintain the life in the body. Levosimendin, a novel inotrope, may well be better, although, and this is from recent meta-analysis, it just pipped past the post in a direct comparison with dibutamine. And the, the data is far from convincing that levosimendin is better. In theory, it potentially could be because you're looking at a drug that doesn't increase myocardial oxygen demand. What are people doing around the world? First of all, they're looking at, um, if we look at mechanical support, the top line is balloon pumps. This is prior to Teal's study in 2011. You can see it's a fairly high level of balloon pump use for patients in cardiogenic shock. We've seen over the last 10 years a progressive rise in short-term and medium-term mechanical support. And I think it's important that when we're looking at short-term mechanical support, whether that's ECMO or, a, or a, a VAD, we really need to be thinking about what is the solution for this patient? What is the access to this, for this patient to ongoing mechanical support? If there is no option for a VAD, if there is no option for transplantation, we need to think very carefully about what our goals of therapy are. The different tools that we have at our disposal provide different levels of support, different physiological benefits um, to each patient. So for example, the balloon pump reduces afterload, whereas ECMO, particularly peripheral ECMO, increases afterload. Coronary perfusion is broadly unknown. Preload can certainly be reduced in patients uh, on ECMO as we're taking blood from the left, from the right side of the circulation directly to the left, etc. The tools that we have, there's no direct studies, but let's look at the Teal study from 2012, which looked at cardiogenic shock post myocardial infarction. 40% mortality at 30 days, 50% mortality at, at a year. No difference between the two groups. And although it certainly improves the physiology, it's difficult to say that it definitely improves outcome. The same is true of the impeller. Limited numbers of studies have been done, consistently demonstrating that it improves cardiac output, consistently demonstrating that lactate comes down. But again, and this is a um, trial of impeller versus balloon pumping, 
difficult to say that there's any actual survival advantage for patients. For ECMO, of course, we have two fundamental types. We have peripheral ECMO or central ECMO. Um, the surgeons among you will have your clear preferences. What's interesting is that several of the surgeons we work with now are moving towards using peripheral ECMO as their post-cardiotomy tool of choice rather than central. So they're getting the chest closed, getting hemostasis, running heparin free in that early post-operative period and using peripheral ECMO as the bridge, which is an interesting, interesting approach and that's been starting to sneak in over the last little while. If we look at a comparison for ECMO in general in cardiogenic shock, there is incredibly limited data. Now, less than 100 patients have had a head-to-head -head ECMO versus balloon pump, um, although on the limited data ECMO appears better, and similar numbers have had um, ECMO versus impeller or tandem heart without any obvious uh, difference. However, the data is incredibly poor and incredibly limited in terms of helping guide us in our decision making. Overall, the outcomes for VA ECMO vary dependent upon what is wrong with you. So, difficult to see here, but myocardial infarction, you're expecting somewhere around 40 to 50% survival. Myocarditis does the best of all. 60, 70, 80% survival in some series. Chronic decompensated or acutely decompensated chronic cardiomyopathy depends on your access to downstream therapies. Septic shock can be up to 70 or 80% survival. And post-cardiotomy is routinely somewhere between 10, 20, 30% survival. But again, it depends very much on the access to downstream therapy. What are the things that determine your outcome? Well, the key, in my mind, is time. Now, if you look at these factors, over on the left, you've got uh, lactate, so a higher lactate, worse outcome. In the middle, you've got pH and creatinine, a lower pH and a higher creatinine, worse outcome consistently. And that really is a marker of time in cardiogenic shock. If you do what most of us do, which is let's give it a few more hours and see what happens, the patient inevitably will die. Age is also incredibly important. The older you are, the more likely you are to die. There have been a number of scoring systems developed, um, and they are including post-cardiotomy so, um, via ECMO, um, but they are only validated in groups where ECMO has already been decided, so they're not that helpful for helping your decision making. But if we look at the groups who do very well, myocarditis, refractory VF, um, do incredibly well. Cardiogenic, uh, post-cardiotomy, not so well. Diagnostics aside, younger patients do better. Patients who are of a normal weight do better. So the cohectic and the overweight do very poorly. Patients with significant liver, renal, CNS dysfunction do very badly. Duration prior to the commencement of ECMO. Getting in there under 10 hours is clearly associated with, with benefit for these patients, as are their initial mortality. And if you look at the SAVE score as it gradually rises, you get a progressive rise in outcome, an improvement in mortality. And really what you want is a, a SAVE score of 0 to 10. What's missing in the SAVE is lactate, and lactate's been consistently associated with improved uh, with, uh, as being associated with mortality, where survivors have a lower pre-ECMO lactate than non-survivors. And that's been put into another scoring system, the Encourage, these are gradually coming out, which looks at, amongst other things, lactate, renal function, um, age, weight, etc. And a low Encourage score gives you a much, much, much better outcome than a high Encourage score. And this is 100% survival, near 100% survival at the top to, to nothing at the bottom. Oh. So, one of the, there are a number of approaches out there in the literature at the moment in terms of how to address these patients. The first is accepting the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock, accepting that the patient's not got a poor urine output because they've got a degree of chronic renal failure. Having an open mind, excluding your surgically correctable problems. 
is there a localised posterior effusion which is causing a degree of subclinical tamponade? And that actually the best thing to do is to take the patient back to theatre. Has the graft got a problem? Do you need to go to the lab? Do you need to get a stent? Do you need to go back to theatre? So, so keep an open mind. Patients will always confound you. Think about, and this, was the, this is the Melbourne group's criteria, think about ECMO very early on. Once you're on a moderate amount of inotropes and vasopressors, in the Melbourne group they use 0.3 mics per kilo per minute of adrenaline equipment, so not a huge dose. Think about once you're on looking at your second inotrope. We know that the addition of a second inotrope is associated with a massive increase in mortality in the post-cardiotomy population. Think about the patients that you're thinking about putting a balloon into. Also look at the patients with inadequate organ support. Look at your hepatic impairment, look at your renal impairment. Oligoanuria is not necessarily part of the standard SERS response. Look at their hypoperfusion, their lactate, and obviously dysrhythmias. Using that approach, the Melbourne group have a nearly 60% um, discharge home alive, neurologically intact. Another approach, uh, which I'm quite fond of, is, is this one, which was published a few years ago, um, which is take the patients in cardiogenic shock and get a balloon in. We know that a balloon won't necessarily improve the health of a population, but it may help individuals. And if what they did was they started with a balloon and then after one hour, if things had not resolved, they moved rapidly over to ECMO. This is to try to better characterize the population. And in their hands, they moved from a 25% survival to a nearly 60% survival. So it's, it's very important to keep an open mind and to look at different modalities of support for an individual patient. You also need access to alternative therapies. In this case, you can see at the top the, um, the survival with access to a, a VADEN transplant program versus survival uh, without access to the same VADEN transplant program. So how do we think about it? We tend to think about it as give them 10 to 12 hours, get the fluid right, get the inotropes right, get them rewarmed, do the simple things well, but don't sit on them all night. Don't say, it'll be fine in another 12 hours. Sit there and watch them. Do the basic things first, get the inotropes on, etc. Get the rhythm right, the rate right, make sure your pacing is right. AV sequential pacing, ideally, if you can. Get them onto VA, but don't stop there. Move straight to investigation. What is wrong with the patient? Why won't they come off? Is there a problem with the surgery? Is there a collection you've missed? Get an echo, get a cardiac cath early on all these patients. Don't say to yourself, I'm sure that the grafts are fine. I'm sure that the arteries are fine. Move straight on, keep that open mind and say, let's just exclude it as being a problem. We need to think about decompressive strategies. Then we need to think about recovery and options prior to palliation. I've got a few minutes left. I think five. five Perfect. Five We're going to talk a little bit about some of the aims of management and, and the concepts of the way we run uh, VA, and it's the very similar to VV in terms of the overall aim. So first of all, rest the heart, rest the lungs. You're in a position that you are able to rest them. Don't keep flogging them with inotropes. You don't need to. Figure out what on earth is going on. Give adequate support for the body and avoid complications. When we're talking about adequate support, we're thinking of two things. We're talking about delivery. And of course, in oxygen delivery, your cardiac output is a combination of your native and your ECMO. So get your access right, get your pre, your, which is equivalent of your preload, your afterload right, and your pump flow. Have enough oxygen content. Give yourself enough hemoglobin to work with, and get the venous sats down above 60 and your lactates down rapidly. Don't necessarily aim for too high a blood pressure. So we would tend to aim for a map of 55 to 60, but we also use cerebral oximetry in order to try to optimize um, cerebral blood flow on the basis that that's the most important part for any individual patient. Manipulate your oxygen delivery. Improve your content optimize your blood flow, decrease your afterload, and if you're still struggling, look at utilization. 
Look at temperature control, look at shivering, look at movement, look at distress, and get those under control. If really necessary, paralyze the patient. This is also what you want. You want a patient who has some ejection. You can see here the valves are opening and closing. There's not a lot of movement in the heart, but there is a little bit. What you don't want is this, a significant left ventricular thrombus. You want to avoid that at all costs. So how can you avoid that? Levosimendin has been shown in a small study, only six in the levosimendin group, to improve the ability to wean. So maybe levosimendin, not increasing cardiac workload. Balloon pump, potentially. It does have physiological effects, even when on ECMO, in terms of improving your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, improving your forward flow through the heart. And in fact, combined with VA ECMO, it appears to improve outcome from a very recent study from this year. You also, when we're thinking about stasis, need to think about other ways of decompressing the heart. So the big problem with ECMO is, of course, the increased afterload, the, increased, the decreased left ventricular ejection fraction. And here what you can see is they've put a transeptal puncture, they've popped a small cannula through the right, um, through, the, through the atrial septum, down through the left atrium, and into the left ventricle in order to decompress the heart better. And they've had this sort of impact on the chest X-ray, going from a complete whiteout to improved. So we do need to think about our strategies for decompressing the heart. We also think, need to think very carefully about our strategies for managing the improving heart, particularly the Harlequin syndrome, where you've got heart ejecting deoxygenated blood because the, the lungs are yet to recover. Clearly, the first thing to do is to look at your increased ventilation. If that's not possible, you need to think about moving over to VV ECMO. In order to um, look after your patient, monitoring is key. And we spend a lot of our time making sure that the monitoring is right for patients. One minute. You often don't have um, a pulsatile circulation, so we use NERS, both cerebrally and on the foot, and we have a schema for our nurses to follow. Finally, when do we start weaning? Well, this is some data from the French group, and they're looking at markers of echo, echocardiographic markers to assist with weaning aortic VTI, pulse pressure, um, and ejection fraction. And as those improve, particularly aortic VTI and ejection fraction, we see a steady improvement in the weanability. And we would tend to go down to low flow for about half an hour or so, down to a litre of pump flow, in order to assess the patient, both echocardiographically and um, in terms of their biochemistry, lactate, SATs, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.